Good afternoon. Young, I think, called it beautiful synchronicity. It is not beautiful, but it is synchronicity that when Rachel and I talked about this class, that we wanted to look at a poet and a journalist who reflected on the history that was being made in Israel and was not all rosy about it, was critical and honest and direct and clear and articulate. We had no idea that we would go through a war from afar and her personally there in Israel where some of the very same things that Alterman saw in his society in his time are being witnessed today, this complexity of struggle in the Middle East. And perhaps it is a lesson we never wanted to learn, but have to learn with the loss of lives that when we look back at those scribes of different times and different places, they give us an incredible understanding of our time and our place. I can't thank Rachel enough for sitting through our sessions while in potential danger. She has a safe room in her house. Um, the first rocket, she went to her safe room two hours after our class two weeks ago with us. And last week would have potentially had to go to that safe room again. And um, she is just such an Asia child. There's no other way, like a soldier, like a, like a, just a, a woman and a soldier and a poet and a teacher and just amazing. And her devotion to teaching is not just about teaching, it's about being Israeli. And that life goes on and we don't let terrorists win and we work towards peace. And so, um, Rachel, I just, I can't thank you enough. I, I adored you before this, but I'm just in awe um, of your devotion to us in our class. And I feel so lucky. Um, I hate that it had to happen, but the timing of this war and your presence with us um, has only magnified the importance of your work and what you do and how it helps us put on lenses to understand today. So I'm going to hand things over to you for mm -hmm. the session today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jessica, for making this happen. And indeed, I mean, nobody in their right mind could have believed how concretely relevant the sessions that the two of us have chosen that many months ago, just because you you loved the combination of poet journalists that Alterman was. And I can tell you that just about an hour ago uh, on my Facebook, my regular Facebook page, not the literary groups, one of my Facebook friends who also studies Alterman with me went like, what would Alterman write these days? And I said to him, you know, I keep thinking about that practically daily. And I'm afraid that with some of, how shall I put this politely without offending anybody, with some of the trends within Israel, Alterman may have been a danger, not from Arabs in Israel, in the mood today with his open critique. And we shall leave it at that. I don't want to go beyond that. Welcome everybody, wonderful to see you for this fourth and last session for now a, of looking at Israeli reality through the very unique lens of Alterman's poetry and more specifically his seventh column, a, which I just repeat for the sake of people who may have joined us only for this lecture, who is a which is a compilation, not all of his poetry, just part of his poetry that dealt with contemporary affairs through a column that he had in the Devar daily paper that does not exist anymore. He had started his career with Haaretz that miraculously still exists today. And beyond his lyrical poetry and other works, he also had contributed a once a week column to deal with contemporary affairs. And we have chosen, I would say, probably the, some of the most famous columns, we call them. We don't call them poems, you call them columns. And one of the beautiful things about them, you know, and oftentimes you want to, to discuss literature in context, then you say, well, the book was published in this and this year, or it came after that book or before that war or whatever. But with Ultimate Seventh Column, we have a super advantage 
that rarely exists when you study poetry. And that is that not only do you know the exact date of publication because it's in the paper, but you can also flip back a two days, three days before the poem and publish and can make the connection of what influenced it or what were the events happening. And indeed in the preparation of my teaching, I often do that. And I flip back digitally, obviously in those papers uh, to see what had happened. So let me quickly just ask because uh, most of the people whose faces I see on the screens now are people that I've seen before. Let me ask if a question came up since last week, a wonderful insight that you would like to share that came your way since we, we looked at last week's poetry, Alzot, because of that, that particular case of IDF misconduct during the War of Independence. And see, since I see no raised hands, and Jessica, will you monitor the chat for me if something comes up? Yes. And let me just go to my PowerPoint screen. And indeed, today we are into Altman again, to the issue of freedom of speech. And we remember, and in case we forgot, Altman died in 1970, but the poem, was, which is pretty many years ago, but uh, the poem we are going to look at is much earlier than that. All the poems that we have chosen together with Jessica to look at are maybe in a span of a decade, no more. A couple of years before the State of Israel with the Captain poem, and then two poems that are directly linked to the War of Independence, the Silver Platter and Alzot, the glory of our soldiers, the shame of some other soldiers, and we have studied them together for a good reason. And now we are flipping a couple of very short time into the state of Israel, but the big difference now is that we have a state and we have a government and we have a parliament and stuff happens. So let us try and before we go there and be because the ultimate poem that we are going to deal with deals with the issue of freedom of speech and because freedom of speech normally reflects the fact that you are by law, by privilege, allowed to express an opinion, even if it's not popular, even if many object to it. And you know, oftentimes Rabbi, you must do that before you start a session of learning, you say a blessing for the learning that we are going to participate in. When I teach this particular class, I use the much later Amichai poem as a sort of a blessing to prepare us to accept ideas that we are not maybe in agreement with, things that may upset us. So can I invite you after I read the Ivrit, can you see the English well enough from the screen, Jessica? Yes, it's okay, great. So I'll do the Ivrit because if it, it's a short poem. Uh, this is Amichai, Yehuda Amichai, much later, very well-known poem, a poet. And I just uh, put a picture because I don't have time to give you his biography right now. We may at some other time study Amichai. I wanted you to get a glimpse of how important he was by the amount of books on the picture. And they are all his books of poetry, okay? So that gives you an idea that we are talking about a major poetic voice. מן המקום שבו אנו צודקים לא יצמחו לעולם פרחים באביב. המקום שבו אנו צודקים הוא רמוס וקשה כמו חצר, אבל ספקות ואהבות עושים את העולם לתחוח. כמו חפרפרת, כמו חריש, ולחישה תישמע במקום שבו היה הבית אשר חרב. Will you do the English for us, Rabbi Jessica? Yehuda Amachai, from the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. 
The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard, but doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Okay, so may we be able to accept the Alterman poem that we are going to look at as a tool to help us see or help us accept doubts, help us accept questioning, even if we are 100% sure that we are right, and yet we want that land like a mole, like a plow, to allow some air inside, some light inside, not be hard. And I'm inviting you to the state of Israel, and I would like to introduce to, to a gentleman. His name is Wafik Tubi. Sometimes when Israelis speak, they speak, they will pronounce his first name as Tufik Tubi, but the right way to pronounce his name is Tawafik Tubi. What you see on the right hand side of your screen is my way of giving you information, but with a particular inclination, with a particular goal in mind. Because I could have given you a screenshot of the Tawafik Tubi Wikipedia page. And I did not opt to do that. I opted to take his page from the site, the internet site of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, which has a page for every single person who ever served on the Knesset. So you can see, and it is in Hebrew and in English and in Arabic. And you can see when he was born is more or less when my father, may he rest in peace, was born. And he, the place of birth was Haifa, which was my hometown for many years in mandatory Palestine. Obviously, in 22, it wasn't the state of Israel. And then he died, you know, he was 88 and also in Haifa. And now the important part for me to, to show you is the number of Knesset, of the times he had served in the Knesset. So all the way from the first to the 12th Knesset, all the way from 1949 to 1990. I'm telling you that so I, I'm 100% sure that you understand, or I'm trying to make 100% sure that you understand that I'm not giving you the voice of a radical, of some unacceptable outlaw minority. I'm inviting you to listen to a member of the house in Israel for 12 rounds from 1949 to 1990. This is as mainstream as one could be. Now I want to give you the flip side because it gives you the names of the parties that he had served that you know there are many parties in Israel, but in this case, Maki, Rakach and Chadash are all the same. They just changed names and titles, but they are all the communist party. Now here is where maybe you take a breath or make a face because I know how the idea of communism is not extremely popular in America and had never been. But the Communist Party then and now is legitimate in Israel. People belong to the Communist Party. It's the only party since its inception that always had Jews and Arabs together. And oftentimes it was a Jew at the head of the party and many times Arabs were at the head of the party and never apart. So you can accept, I trust the fact that we are dealing with a member of the house and you can have doubts because he is a communist and you don't like communism that much, that I can understand. So I sort of want you to embrace the two side of it, okay? And here is Taufik Tubi. And now you may ask yourself, what was the reason, what had happened in one of those days 
in one of those early knesset, we say, or knessets, that would bring Alterman, the Jewish writer from Tel Aviv, to write a poem about Tufik Tubi or Taufik Tubi. So let's check it out. So already Alterman will do a motto for the poem. And I gave you a motto before mainly because what had transpired at the end of our session last time. You remember that when we concluded Alzot because of that, and we saw the very harsh criticism of Nathan Alterman of the conduct of the IDF and Ben-Gurion being the head of state, but also the minister of defense, also the boss of Alterman through the paper, I ask you, what do you think will be the reaction of Ben-Gurion? And one of you at least, whom I, I let speak, invited to speak, said, I don't think that he would have liked it. And then I showed you Ben-Gurion's reaction and you were very pleased of how differently than what you think. So this is an opposite case. This will be a case where Alterman will embrace a topic that Ben-Gurion will not like the Alterman uh, opinion. So let me do both the Ivrit and the English. Kim'at kolak chavrei ha-knesset yatsu negdo b'charifut, v'sar ha-bitachon David Ben-Gurion amar ki divrei tubi ha-mashmatsat medinat Yisrael ama u-tzva'a. למיעוט הערבי יש זכות לביקורת, אך יש להבחין בין ביקורת לבין הפקרות. Almost all members of the Knesset opposed him viciously. And David Ben-Gurion, the Minister of Defense, he doesn't say the Prime Minister, but he was both at the time, had said that Tubi's words were a defamation of the State of Israel, its people and its army. The Arab minority has the right to critique but there should be a difference between critique and lawlessness. So Alterman wrote something about the conduct of Tufik Tubi in the Knesset, which obviously was a criticism of the state. Ben-Gurion deems that this was not right and it is a defamation of the state of Israel, the people and the army all put together. So you could have sworn that this was written yesterday, right? But <laughs> anyway. Let us go into the topic and try and figure it out. Rachel, just to clarify, that's what was in Davar that week? Oh, that, yeah. No, so, no, no. Do, okay. No, this will appear in the book. You okay. will never have these mottos in the paper because how could Altman know what Ben Gurion will say? Okay. But uh, later on, it will appear when the poems appear in a book. And now, as opposed to that, I'm giving you already one quote from the poem, which we will see in a minute. Who is Tufik Tubi? A Knesset member, a communist, an Arab who sits in that house by full right. And even from this beginning of a quote, you can see where Alterman will be going. He will put the three important elements together. First of all, he is a lawfully elected member of the House. He is a Knesset member. There are three elections in the State of Israel. He was elected through his party. Then he will give you the thing that people like less. He is a communist and also an Arab and put all these things together and Alterman could conclude, but he sits in that house by full right. We are not doing him a favor. This is his rightful place to be. That was hard to swallow, okay? In the young it, It's like Lech Lecha, like Abraham, like, like yeah, three, three descriptions. You will see oftentimes, uh, in an Alterman poem, biblical structures. And even if you look at the Ivrit, you will be even more aware of that. Uh, Rabbi Jessica, is it okay for me to ask you to continue reading as I do the Ivrit? That's fine. Okay. So let me bring the Ivrit on. 
and it's the reprimand to Tufik Tubi. So from the name of the poem, the title of the poem, we understand that Alterman is going to relate to a reprimand. Tufik Tubi had done something and he was reprimanded. And Alterman will ask, Uvchen mi hu Tufik Tubi? Hu chaver knesset, komunist, aravi, bevet anivcharim, yoshev hino bezchut melea velo bechesed. Kvar et ulai lizkor zot chaverim? ואין הוא חב בזה כל חוב על גודל נפש, ישיבתו היא חוק, היא צו, היא א' ב', לא, אין הפרלמנט צריך ביד מונפת לזרוק לו מדי פעם את הגט. So, who is Taufik Tubi? He is a member of the Knesset, an Arab communist, in the parliament. He sits there with full rights and not out of charity. Perhaps it's time to remember this, Chaverim. He owes us no debt for greatness of soul. His position is legal. It is a commandment. It is as basic as ABC. No, the parliament should not, with a waving hand, throw a get at him once in a while. Okay, so let me, it's not the end of the poem, obviously. So let me tell you a word about translation, because as I have, must have mentioned earlier, a Alterman is really not translated well enough into English. So if I choose together with people like Rabbi Jessica and others to teach a given poem, in most cases, I will need to translate it myself and, and seek the help of some people who will make it better English, etc. Why am I telling you all this? Because in this particular case, I've decided to leave two Hebrew words within the English translation. One is then the last a line and the last word of the first verse, and that's the word chavirim. And I tell you why I have left it. Because the proper translation would have been comrades. And comrades in English would make an allusion to the Communist Party, and it wasn't the intent of Alterman because the, the word chavirim does not say that. The word chaverim is used in every kibbutz. The word chaverim, the word chaver was used by President Clinton to mourn Rabin. So I was afraid that the proper translation into English will create a message that was not intended by the poet. The other word that I left on the last line of the second verse is that the parliament should not with a waving hand throw a get. And I left the Hebrew, the get are the divorce papers, but I left the Talmudic word for get, get gerushin, get pitorin, and so that you, you get the sense because Alterman could have used another metaphor of other members of the Knesset, you know, throwing in the face of Tufik Tubi, ah, we are doing you a favor by letting you speak up here. So this is one thing I want you to notice. The other thing is in the third but last a line of the second verse. His position, one up, is legal. It is a commandment. That's a biblical language. Tzav, mitzvah. First of all, it's a law. It's legal. That's the law in the state of Israel. Then we go to the traditional word of etzav, which is the same as mitzvah. And then to the third one, and it is as basic as ABC, but the Hebrew says just Aleph Bet, and you should get that, Hevre. You really don't need to be nuclear scientists to get that. This is exactly what Alterman is telling them. You know, this is simple. And stop waving that get in his face every single time he gets up to speak by suggesting how generous we are and how kind. Okay, let us go to the next page. Here I want to stop for a minute, explain, give you the background. And I, I do want to be transparent here. And I do want to tell you that other people place differently on the ideological continuum of us, the Jewish people, will describe these facts to you differently maybe. 
So I'll try to be as mainstream as I can. During what we Israelis and Jews call our War of Independence, 1940 and 47, and to the beginning of 49, among other things that happen, there is a huge Arab population within British Mandate Palestine, part of which will become the state of Israel when the ceasefire is achieved in 49, the armistice rather. And during the events of the war, 750,000 Palestinians will be, and now I'm giving you three verbs to choose from as your ideology pleases, will be kicked out and sent out of their villages, will be running for their lives, or will be persuaded to leave by the leadership with the promise that they will be coming back victorious. I trust that you must have heard all three verbs used. I will go for run away for their life. Yes, kicked out and put on, on lorries, it's out in other cases. And yet, oftentimes, listening to war propaganda from Palestinian and other leaders, believing that if they just went out of the zone of danger and once their armies will win the victory, they will be coming back. All true. All true, you do not need to differ. The result is that 450 Palestinian villages and little towns are evacuated, taken over by us Israelis, and the Palestinians become refugees. Where do they run to? Many places. Some of them go across the border to Lebanon, to Egypt, but the Egyptians will never let them in. This is why they are in the Gaza Strait in the northern part of Sinai, it connects to our days. They will run to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and then after the war of 67, they will come again under Israeli rule. Some who can afford, because they are always people who can afford, will go across the sea to Europe and to America and to other places. And some will run within the country. They will leave their own village and move to the nearby largest city, believing that it will be safer. Or there is a young family that is in that particular village and with the parents being in the town nearby, and they will say, come, just stay with us. And when it's all over, you'll go back to your home and to your field, which they could never do. So all these people who are now refugees with a very little to their you know, of the property. After things settle down and are quiet and the borders are more or less settled, we never had a peace agreement with most of these countries, but we did have ceasefire. Do you hear the noise in the background? Yeah, a little bit. A little, it doesn't it disturb some... you in any way? because it's a neighbor no. drilling something and I could ask them to stop. Okay, <laughs> okay let me ask. You I'm less opinionated than others. So uh, okay. it doesn't bother me, but. Okay. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. Not a problem. Okay, because he's a nice neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do they do? As, as things settle down, they are trying to come back. And they cannot officially anymore because the state of Israel on a given day had counted all the people present and anybody who is not present were related to as absentees and they lost their right to Israeli citizenship and their property. It was confiscated by the state. Now, some of them are trying to come back at night spend some time with family on the Israeli side of the border. And these are mainly agriculturals. And they want to go back to their homes and maybe pick the fruit or the olives or the grapes 
or maybe take a few things from their home that was destroyed, but maybe some stuff was left over. The Israeli IDF is viciously after them. And every night there are searches on these borderline Arab towns and villages that are within Israel to look for these infiltrators, okay? And what Tufik Tubi is going to do in the Knesset is to get up and now you need to be very careful. He is critical, not of the fact that the IDF is looking for infiltrators. He is critical of the way it is done. Ruthlessly, with violence, with no, you know, human conduct to women, pregnant women, babies, elderly. And he gets up, summons all his courage. These are the early days of the state of Israel. The Arabs who remained are really looked down by, by the Jewish Israeli population at the time. And yet this man gets up his courage and he will get up in the Knesset and he will speak to the fact that these screening, scrutiny in the border villages maybe can be done differently, okay? That is his only point. Let us go straight to the English, will you, Rabbi Jessica? Yes. Um, I'll put the Hebrew on just in case somebody wants okay. to see. Um, I don't know the squires that were, um, but, and it should not under any circumstance tell him you are speaking freely. The, it is the Knesset, right? Or the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because I am good, I am generous, supporter of freedom. It is not appropriate, even in a private party. It is time to decide at last, like all the other representatives, to be too is there by virtue of the regime. And if this is serious, we should not hand him a bill to be paid for the right every other day. This is the nature of democracy. It's squires. I'm just looking at the, it's squires should not, Creditors be. Oh, okay. Carry Got their it. Arms. it. Squires okay. should not creditors be. It is not easy, but it is not, if it is not self evident, it will not be evident at all. So you have some American, uh, I don't know, self evident is a, a potent American founding statement. We hold yeah, these I truths know. to be self evident. Help me do the, the, this translation. Got it. So let's look at it verse by verse. And it, the Knesset, the ones who were throwing him the get in the previous verse, should not under any circumstances tell him L is missing, that you are speaking freely because I am good. I am generous, supporter of freedom. It is not appropriate even in a private party. So first of all, this self-righteousness that some of us has, you know, the, we are the only democracy in the Middle East. They should be grateful. Let's see them speak like that in Syria or Iraq or Egypt, you know? We even say it today. How much I, I, yeah, I can't believe he articulated this then because this is now, I mean, it's, it's such a disturbing thing about, I think the American Jewish community that we try and Can act like this, it? like they're so lucky. You know, it's, yeah, it's amazing he articulated. That, that's the thing. And Alterman is able to see, say this in 49, for God's sake. You know, 72 or more years ago, he already sees that and he calls upon the Knesset. Not a big surprise that Ben-Gurion didn't like it. Okay? And now look at this last line of the first verse. It is not appropriate even in a private party. So, you know, Israelis then and now we get together every Friday and we run the country in 10,000 parliaments that meet in every home in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa and every single kibbutz. This is who we are. This is what we do. And Altman says this is inappropriate even in a private circle. Stop this righteousness. It is time to decide at last 
like all other representative, to be two is there by virtue of the regime. This is what we are proud of. The only democracy, blah, blah. And if this is serious, we should not hand him a bill to be paid for the right, for this right every other day. Be grateful, thank us because we are so nice. And now Altman, you know, he's flying off. This is the, the nature of democracy. This is what we are so proud of, proud of. Yalla, it's quiet. The people who hold, you know, the democracy, who hold it up, should not creditors be. You do not hand in the bill every day. It is not easy, I know. But if it is not self-evident, it will not be evident at all. If we do not from day one treat this as normal, as routine, as the way things should be, it will never become evident. Let's continue. Okay, Hebrew is there, and now he comes to the crux of the matter, okay? So far, he was just, you know, teaching the Knesset a lesson in his poem. And now let's come to the thing itself, these searches. Combing, they used in Hebrew the word, look, I'll, I'll read a bit of the Hebrew to you. The first two lines, Achshav Elaikar, now to the crux of the matter, Yad Hatsavasoreket. The army's hand is combing. It's as if it's going like a comb through the hair and to look, you know, in between every single hair. He's using here a verb that can be used like searches and scrutiny, we use the word soreket, but metaphorically it suggests how, how deep and close and, and into intimate parts this search will go. Let's do the English. And now to the crux of the matter, the army's combing hand. Not a week goes by without one, and every intelligent man knows it is not a ritual of polite creek less bowing. It is true we do not call our journalists to attend, as we do to photography parties, though it may seem if we did, they wouldn't leave empty-handed. One thing is clear. When a member of Knesset rises with a different image of the searching, it is not less important than one of the press that praises the collaboration of the populace. It was the custom then and now, when you wanted to be nice to speak how most of the Arabs are okay. And most of the Arabs, the populace, the populace, the Arab population is collaborating, is work, working nicely with us, is bowing their heads. For that, we have pictures. Do you know that in the early years of Israel, it was, I don't want to say forcibly, but with a lot of persuasion, it was upon them to celebrate your Matzimaut with Israeli flags and such. It is not done anymore. But they wanted pictures of how the Arab population is collaborating, working together. And Alterman is saying, you like to take those pictures? <clears throat> when can I assure you that had we let the journalists go into the searches, they would come up with a few pictures worthwhile looking at of how the army, the IDF conducts itself. Okay, so here's a picture, you know, of, of the ones that you don't know what, how to look at it, like with the Israeli soldiers standing with their guns at an Arab citizen and what exactly is happening there. And let's look to the, let's go to the last part. So he is rising to give a different picture of these searches and we should listen to him. Let's listen to the conclusion of the poem. I cannot hear he, he, you. Sorry, sorry. He had facts not yet denied. He had asked for an inquiry. So what's the outcome? No, it is an unhealthy forest, this forest of hands that had already decreed a slander. The topic was removed without any debate. Is it really so empty of content? And we comb fiercely as we all well know, 
It is not so good to comb without combing your own hair. If a communist Arab had asked for it, it is no reason to tear the request apart. No, especially as it seems this time, he is doing what the government had not done. Oh, it makes like today inevitable. Makes I mean, you cry. You know? Yeah, it, it makes, I mean, it's a faulty foundation. Yeah. You can't build a house on a faulty foundation. Okay, so here it is, <clears throat> and Ben-Gurion comes out against it, and this is one of the cases, then there are a few. Lots of times Ben-Gurion accepted the Alterman criticism. Lots of times he did not find favor with it. Let me tell you what transpired many years later, because this has something to do with me. So, in the year 2015, which is not that long ago, the Deputy Minister of the Interior, in a speech in the Knesset relating to the Arab citizens, he was saying the following, citizenship to the Arabs, we are doing you a favor. He actually said that in the Knesset six years ago, not 73 years ago. And when that happened, I, you know, I followed that and I spoke to Yossi and I said, did they never read Alterman in school? Like, did, not, did this not become self-evident? At the time, we had an amazing a journalist who unfortunately died of cancer three years ago, a close friend of Yossi, my husband, Moshe Negbi. He was a a, a, a person of law, like he studied law, but also a journalist. And he had a radio program and later also on television. He was the expert on the legality of the conduct of parties, the government, the police, etc. With a weekly program that all of Israel listened to religiously. And Yossi tells me, call Moshe Negbi and remind him of the Alterman poem because he has his program in an hour and he's going to speak about this. And I said, Yossi, there is no way Moshe Negbi doesn't know the poem. So Rachel, call him. So I did. And I said, Moshe, I, I really, I don't want to offend you and for sure you know, but you know, Alterman Tufik Tubi said, oh, I'm looking it for hours. Where is it? Can you send it to me? <laughs> because, you know, I know my way in Alterman and I can find a poem like this in two minutes, but if you are not a teacher of literature, you wouldn't. So I immediately photocopied it and sent it to him. And that day on the radio, a uh, Moshe Negbi in 2015 used the very same poem. So in way of leading towards a conclusion, I want to take you a step further because this is 49. And things transpire and will help us conclude in an interesting way. So in the year 1953, so you see that we have moved ahead a few years. And there is an article in Haaretz that Morgenthau, who is not in office anymore in the American government, he said that Abba Ibn suggested to him, the Israeli ambassador, that Israel was willing to help the U.S. with 200,000 sol soldiers in the war against Korea. Now, the whole thing in itself does not sound realistic. I don't know what kind of journalist published this, but it was published in Haaretz. It's a fact. I don't know that Abba Eben said that. I don't know that Morgenthau quoted it, but it was in Haaretz. And there is a newspaper, mind you, communist, the same newspaper of the same party of our friend Tufik Tubi and Jewish friends. It is called the Hebrew version Kol Ha'am, the voice of the people, and in Arabic, the same Al Intihad. And they're furious of Abba Evan volunteering Israeli soldiers to fight alongside America against Korea. They are communists, remember? So they publish an article called, Let Abba Ibn Go to War. If Abba Ibn is so anxious to go and fight the Koreans, let him go to war and not our soldiers. It's on the right-hand side of the screen. I have it translated, all of it, if you want. It's really, you know, it's a communist rag. 
you, you will not enjoy it. The Minister of Interior, Rokach, closes down the paper, Kol Ha'am and al Tihad, immediately the following day, the Hebrew paper for two weeks, the Arabic paper for a month, for good measure, okay? They go to the Supreme Court. They actually do. They go and both papers appeal to the Supreme Court of Justice because the Minister of Interior had closed them down. And here is a bit of the article. So Ben-Gurion, Bronstein government did not react at all to Abba even announcement about his willingness, et cetera, et cetera. And second paragraph, Abba even announcement is a unique even among the Atlantic camp, it's NATO, and every government in is an aggressive, this is communist language, you can see it. It's against the United States, it's against the, uh, the NATO, the, the Atlantic agreement, all of it. And we do not need to agree to any single word. It's really something classical of communist journalism. But it goes before the Supreme Court. And the judge is Justice Agranat, who was born where? Anybody? In Kentucky. He is the only judge in Israel who brings the language of American way of thinking about the law and of what is self-evident. And he will, you know, he will rule and decide. And this is one of the rulings in Israel that is most often quoted in courts when the questions of freedom of speech arise. And I always use it to answer the following question. When you say the words, Israel is the only democracy, la 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 la, where does it say that Israel is a democracy? Because it doesn't say so in the Declaration of Independence, it's not there. So I'm now going to show you a historical document in which for the first time it is stated in an official State of Israel document that Israel is a democracy. Will you read it for us? all of it, because we need to listen to these words. I think you have to change the slide, uh, advance the slide. It's there. Can you see it? It's not on my screen. I just, no, just the timeline and the Hebrew article. There it is. Now it's there. So read the whole thing, not just the red box. I think so. Okay. Although the declaration is not a constitutional law, but it expresses the vision of the people and its credo, Therefore, it is our obligation to pay attention to the things it has declared. When we are about to interpret and make meaning to the laws of the state, including those that were created during the British mandate and were adopted by the state following its establishment, it is a well-known axiom that the law of the people should be studied as a reflection of its national life system. From what is written in the Declaration, we can assume that Israel is a democracy. Thus, the privileges and values without which a democracy is not possible must be applied. And first and above all of these privileges is the freedom of expression. The principle of the freedom of expression is, a strongly, is strongly bound to the democratic process. A simple understanding of a democratic regime automatically results in the application of the principle of freedom of expression in any state that is founded on such a regime. This elevated privilege, together with its companion, the privilege of freedom of conscience, are the precondition for the realization of all other freedoms. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first document, 1953, mm -hmm. officially, where somebody says that Israel is a democracy. So here is my invitation to you. When next you come to Israel, go see the building of the Supreme Court, but stop at the square in front of it, where it is Kikar HaShofet Agradat, is Justice Agradat Square. As you enter the building of the Supreme Court, Israel had opted to honor the American judge who made Aliyah, who brought to Israel this particular voice. 
and he is honored thus that you cannot enter the Supreme Court without crossing Justice Agronath Square. I'd like for us or for you, if you will, to take with you from this class and maybe the previous ones as well. How oftentimes when we speak of the great people of any given society, Israel included, we speak of prime ministers and of presidents of oftentimes in our case in generals. And sometimes great history is done by other people. In this case, Justice Agronat of the Supreme Court, who died that many years ago. Nathan Alterman, who even died like 20 years before him. And member of Knesset Tufik Tubi, who was with us until 10 years ago. And a couple of years before he died, a journalist tells the story. He attended a party in Nazareth where he lived at the time. And there was a young journalist who came to speak to him and didn't know who he was. And he probably didn't want to tell him all his history. So, you know, he said, I'll tell you one thing about me. Alterman once wrote a poem about me. So a Tufik Tubi probably carried this moment of his career very dearly in his heart, the day Alterman wrote a poem about him. So take these three people with you because in creating what the state of Israel, I will have to say at this point, hopes to be, these are very important three people who contributed to what we aspire to be in the state of Israel. I, I think this is a good moment for me to stop because we are left just with a few minutes. And in case there are any comments or questions, I'd love to entertain them now. You can unmute. Uh, Aileen, go ahead. Aileen and then Judy. Sure. Um, Rachel, <coughs> was Alterman a prolific writer right to his death? Uh, yes, one could say so. So I'm teaching poems that he died in 70. I'm teaching poems that he published in 68. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Judy and then Bobby. I just can't thank you enough for this wonderful month. You have just given us so much. I've been taking notes and my hands falling off. And I <laughs> want you to know when I first heard of Altman, it was in the, in the series Schlissel. Ah, Oh, when yes, he, exactly. I yeah. know, I remember. He argues, <laughs> what about the old poets, Altman and Black? And that's what really intrigued me. But thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful experience. Rachel, I really enjoyed it. Rachel, before we go to Bobby, I just want to point out um, Bobby and Jack and the Feldmans have been studying with you since the pandemic began. Can you let us know your future teaching plans for the world at large? Um, after I don't know uh, if you absolutely. want Bobby's question absolutely. first. I'll, t I'll take a minute. Had I known, I would have included it in the PowerPoint. But a, are these people part of my mailing list? Because it's so, not strongly advised that you... Yes, write we already have it. Some, some are. Some oh, aren't. There, so, I, I only know to access you through the Facebook group. But okay. um, so on, on, Facebook. on June 1st, we are starting the summer semester of nine weeks. That will have again the Tuesday and Thursday. The difference will be, that, yeah. The difference yeah. will be that on Tuesdays we will have women poets, and on Thursdays we will have guy poets. <laughs> and also, I'm starting a, a totally new activity that will be on Mondays, and it will start May 31st, and that will be Ivrit Kala. So, for those of you who have some Ivrit, not enough to join my classes in Hebrew, but we will do a gentle, mild Ivrit class where we will discuss one poem in a session and we will look, the English will be available to you. You will be able to speak e either in Ivrit or in English, but we will look a little bit at issues of translation, of what can be gleaned from the Hebrew that is not in the translation, etc. So we will be doing sessions in Ivrit Kala every Monday. And on Sundays, we have book clubs. 
So what you need to do is just get on my mailing list. You will have the once a week email with all the information, the source sheets, and anything that you may need to participate in the classes. Okay, okay. Bobby had a question. Yeah. Should I put your email in the chat? Yeah. Okay. And poetry classes are free, donations are welcome. There is a suggested fee for the Ivrit Kala and the book clubs, but everybody is welcome regardless of money. Okay. And, and um, yes. It's not conditional on payment. Yeah. Yes. And um, Madeline Siegel has helped us sponsor. She let me finally announce her name um, for this, but she has helped us sponsor this and some of the classes um, with you and others as well. The, um, and and the, the Feldman's hosted you when you're here and the Kalman's have helped. So, you know, it's, if anyone wants to sponsor class as well. Bobby had a question. I'm going to put your um, email in the chat so people yeah, can be added to And then I have a comment. How many uh, members of the Communist Party are in the Knesset today? Is it a big party? Uh, they're now united because the majority of the Communist Party now are Arabs with a couple of Jews and they united with two other Arab parties in order to form a stronger bloc and they were not that successful because the Islamic party among the Arabs got more representation. So I think they are now at six, all the three parties together. Yeah. Well, we just got an email today that someone was complaining about the, um, the women who criticized Israel in the Congress and that the complaint was that the Democrats do nothing to refute them or tell them not to make these anti-Semitic comments. And this is the same issue that this, these poems were, where we're a democracy and we have freedom of speech, whether you like it or not. You were elected and it's your right to say what you wanna say. So I just thought it was really current to what happened in my house today. Oh, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to use my imagination. <laughs> Thank you for that. Any uh, other comments or questions? I, I just, I can't, ex I think I said it on the first week, but like from day one, um, Rachel, you're just a pivoter. And she pivoted and she started this online learning. It literally, like the first months of the pandemic, it was every day. I remember sitting in July. One yeah, fifteen. We are. are it was online. amazing, and I I get the credit for. We, I said Temple Bethel is going to sponsor this session, and she had maxed out to a hundred people, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm raising the money you need to get to the next, you know, yeah. level to let in a thousand. Because I was like, I'm not going to have angry congregants who can't log on. To. So for you, that's how much I'm invested in the synagogue that I was like terrifying. Um, yeah. No, I, I, and um, and now it's just blown. I mean, I saw you have one point two thousand um people in your Facebook group. I don't even know if you saw it. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it started from nothing. She eight hundred twenty yeah. on my mailing list. Yeah, I haven't learned this regularly with a teacher since school, and you really changed my learn. I, I, the way I teach has changed from you. You just delve and delve and delve and put your heart into it, and it, it's just you're the best. God willing. When you plan your American uh, trip, Not that yet, um, but it will be coming. I know okay. it will. I know okay. it will. Okay, good, good. Else I think I think that is <laughs> it. <laughs> ready, Raquel. <laughs> <laughs> your bed at the Feldman's is ready, where you stayed last time. It's uh, okay, it's thank ready. You. Thank you yes. so much. Okay. And come to the poetry classes. We have a makeup class today for the class that was canceled because of the, of the rackets. So which was the, which was the day you uh, were you were with us? Uh, um, it was a Tuesday, and it was one of the CUMs for the previous semester. And I'm offering a makeup class today. It's in your email. You have the link. You have the text and everything. And if not, uh, email me quickly, and I will forward it to you. And I just want to remind you um, for the next month, um, it is LGBTQ and Inclusion Lunch and Learn series with Rabbi Weissman. Um, and a great month of lunch and learn programming. So we're looking forward to having everyone there at at, um, at our lunch and learn in June on multiple platforms as well. Thank you to everyone. Rachel, we can't thank you enough. We went through a war with you. you. We never imagined such things, but a we would know. War. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need some normal now. Amen, amen. All right. 
you stay in peace. All right. Tada. Thank you, everyone. Kira, thank you, our amazing producer as well. Kira, I said, Kira, be the producer for this because she is from Israel and, and this is personal. So, Kira, thank you so much. I'm so glad you listened to me and hopefully got something out of this month as well. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.